Welcome back everyone. In this video, we'll be going over six SAT questions that are extremely hard that you must memorize how to get correct. If you get these questions correct, you can get any question correct. And I'll walk through live examples of these problems so you know exactly what I'm talking about, you know exactly how to solve them. Okay, so starting off with the first question. First question is number 14 is a conjugate question. A lot of students mess this question up because, well, to be honest with you, they just don't really understand how conjugates work or they've never really looked into it too heavily. So the way this really works is you basically multiply the bottom by the conjugate. So in this case, it's three plus two I. And then you multiply the top as well by three plus two I. This, anytime you see this fraction for a conjugate problem, for a, a imaginary question, you know automatically that, hey, this most likely is gonna ask me to take the conjugate, right? And that's why I literally, first thing I do is just do this quick calculation. So the bottom becomes nine, or the inner and the outer term cancel because it's um, a plus b, a minus b. So now you're left with minus four i squared. i squared is equal to negative one, because you square this and you square this, you get i squared equals negative one, right? So, okay. The top part, so that's, that's 24 minus 3i, right? And no, it's okay if you wanna, you know, uh, write it all out. Plus 16i minus 2i squared, i squared is negative one, same thing as plus two. So let's simplify. The denominator becomes nine plus four, so that's 13. The numerator is just 26 plus 13i. So if we split this fraction up, we get two, plus i. So that's asking what's the value of a? The answer is two. Pretty simple question as long as you know how to get the conjugate. The next question we're gonna do is finding how many ordered pairs satisfy system equations below, either linear or quadratic. In this case, it's quadratic. So it is possible we get a, a, a graph like this, or we could get a graph like this where it just intersects like right here, so one point, right? Or we could get a graph where they just never intersect. Okay, so for this one, the first thing we're gonna do is we're probably gonna set the y's uh, equal to each other. So let's transform this equation. So this becomes two y is equal to x minus five. So y is equal to x minus five divided by two. X minus five divided by two is the same thing as one half x minus five over two. And then we also have this quadratic right here. So that's equal to two x squared minus three x plus 18 x that's plus 15 x minus 27. Okay, so the way this line is looking like it's, um, we got, see this graphically, we got a, a line that's going up some sort of way, one every one over two. And then we got a quadratic that has I mean, x is zero, y is negative 27, okay? Like we know quadratic's opening up, so it's gonna go like this, and it's gonna go like this, right? Now, this is enough for us to know, or it could be like something like this as well. If this is 27, it could be like this, and then boom. The point remains that this line, or right, however, however way you wanna shift it, is going to cross this quadratic in two separate locations. So, how many uh, order pairs satisfy? Two. So number 16, the what I like about it a lot is that it captures the use of triangles. Triangles, a lot of students mess up on a lot, especially when it comes to similar triangles. This problem, while it may look hard, becomes super easy once you know exactly what to look for. The total height of the system is 18 inches. We got that. Three parallel shelves. We got that. What is the maximum height inches of a shampoo ball that can stand upright? So basically, what's the max of this? What's the height from this from this base to this base, all right? For a similar triangle, what you gotta do is you set up proportions. The proportions, proportions, proportions. So in this case, we add all these together, right? Like this, this, and this. We get six x equals 18, which means x equals three. So now that we know x equals three, we're just trying to figure out, you know, the height of this. That means the height from here to here is three. From here to here is nine. And from here to here is six. So it's uh, pretty self-explanatory once you plug it in, uh, you plug in x equals three. You can see that, well, the answer is right there. We plugged in three, we got it. The answer is nine. See, it might look confusing at first. You might think there's some subtraction need going on, but none of that is true for this problem as long as you know that, hey, if I set up a proportion, because similar triangles, I can figure out how like the height is, like how this will all work. This is one of my favorite problems because it's so easy, but students get so scared of how many words this is. But let's really break it down, okay? While preparing to run a marathon, Amelia created a training schedule in which the distance of her longest run every week increased by a constant amount. If Amelia's training schedule requires that her longest run in week four is distance of eight, four, eight miles, and her longest run in week 16 is distance of 26 miles, which of the following best describes the distance Amelia runs change between week four and week six? So we're trying to find ROC, rate of change, correct? Okay, so week four is eight miles. So if you were to make coordinates at week four, it's eight miles. Week 16 is 26. If I'm reading the answer choices to guide me, remember always using answer choices to help you know guide you. We're trying to find the rate of change, right? And we know y2 minus y1 
over x2 minus x1 equals m, correct? So let's just do that. Let's plug it exactly in how we have right here. 26 minus 8 over 16 minus 4 equals m, okay? 26 minus 8 is 18. 16 minus 4 is 12. 18 over 12 is the same thing as 1.5. So it looks like it's an increase of 1.5 right here every single week. See how we took such a long problem and shortened it? We never read this again. We only read this once, right? We didn't read it multiple times and waste our time. No, we only read it once, found what we needed, the necessary calculations, wrote down key information, used the instructions to help us, and we were able to solve this problem pretty easily. All right, so for these next two problems I'm gonna go over, these are a circle problem and another problem that you'll see very shortly. I'm not actually gonna do the work, but I'm gonna say exactly how to do it. But first, I want you guys to pause this video right here or go on like 0.25 speed because I want you to solve this problem on your own. Number nine, you can do this problem mentally, which is why I'm not even gonna pick up my pencil or move my mouse. All you have to do, you read this question, you know it's a circle problem because it's a circle equation. Point P is on the circle, so it's on the circle, right? So you got the circle, it's on, it's on the ends, and it has coordinates 10, negative five. All right, I'm thinking in my head, 10, negative five. P, Q is the diameter of the circle, which means P is one end point and Q is the other, okay? So what are the coordinates of point Q? R squared is 16. That means R equals four, right? Because it's the radius. So if you have point P, which is on one end, to get from point E to the center of the circle is radius four. So that becomes six negative five, because 10 minus four is six. Now to get a point Q, which is on the other side of the circle, right? You go from the radius and you subtract the radius to get to the other end. So now that's six minus four again. So you end up with two negative five. Boom, simple problem. But a problem like this will confuse a lot of students because they get tripped up about how this looks like. But guess what? If you just draw this, you'll see how much more it makes sense. Point P on a circle, 10, negative five, and keep, the, keep a, a horizontal line right through the circle, right? That'll act as your PQ line. P is on one end, 10, negative five, move over four. That's the center, six, negative five, move over another four, boom, two, negative five. You arrived at point Q, done. I'm trying to tell you all, it's too easy. It's so easy if you just know exactly what to look for. But these are some of the hardest SAT problems that if you guys get these right and memorize how to get them right, the exact tips and tricks used, you'll be able to knock out 90% of SAT questions because these are the questions that trip up a lot of students like these types. So if this becomes cakewalk to you, everything's gonna be easy for you. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe and leave a comment saying which of these problems gave you the most challenge. That way other students know, hey, maybe I wanna practice this problem a little extra. So be sure to comment that down below. Thank you all for watching, peace.